around the world. The Spirit is moving and a voice is being heard. Welcome to The Voice of Evangelism with David Langford. You can write to The Voice of Evangelism at P.O. Box 502, Kayser, North Carolina, 28020. We'll give you that address again at the close of today's broadcast. But here now is David Langford. Good evening, friends. David Langford here. We'd like to welcome everyone to the Voice of Evangelism International Ministries. Today is Tuesday, October the 4th, 2024. Excuse me, 2022. 2024 will be here quick enough, won't it, without me adding two years on there that quickly. Let me encourage you to seek the face of God. Let me encourage you to pray and read your Bible. You need strength. You'll get that from the Word of God. You need encouragement. You'll get that from the Word of God. You need edification. You'll get that from the Word of God. Everything that you have need of, you can find it in the Word of God. God is more than enough for every need that we have in our lives. Amen. As I've said a few weeks ago, if we don't pray and seek the face, the counsel of God, I believe they'll steal the midterm election. We live in a very dishonest society. As I said yesterday about the chief priest and the elders and the government got in the bed over the resurrection of Christ. And they distorted the truth. And that's what liars and politicians and people of that nature do. They distort the truth. I find it so humorous. Biden says 0% inflation, yet they passed the Inflation Act. Spent over a trillion dollars in August alone. Think of that. A trillion dollars. A thousand dollars million dollars. It's crazy. It's crazy. Excuse me. Be ten thousand million dollars. A thousand million is a billion. Numbers get so large, they get so huge, they get so behemoth, it's hard to fathom, it's hard to comprehend how much is being spent and just wasted. You saw the other day, I'm sure the government, the Pentagon has told the military soldiers, families, apply for food stamps. Yeah, we got billions of dollars to send in money and material to Ukraine. We left between 85 and $90 billion worth of equipment in Afghanistan, and we tell the people of the military, apply for food stamps. This, this is becoming a very wicked, wicked people. Sad, very sad. But that's the signs of the time. Jesus said it would be a covetous and a wicked generation. And that is so apropos in this hour. When we pray, something happens. Sometimes it doesn't happen immediately, but something happens truly happens when we seek God's face. I would that more people had a thirst, a vast appetite for God. God is truly not a hard taskmaster, but many today have lost their desire for the Lord. I got a letter from a 90-year-old lady the other day, she's a widow, and she was sharing about the 1930s and 40s, how the, she was a Methodist, how the churches used to be full, people singing and worshiping, the windows were raised, people were standing around the churches wanting to hear the word of the Lord. All of that's gone. All of that's passed by. Jesus said the love of many is going to wax cold. I do not want you waxing cold on my watch. 
That's why I will minister and preach in the method and manner in which I do. I want to be faithful in my generation. I want to have faithfully served my generation, what God has called me to do. And I'm afraid that many today are just not living that kind of a life wherein they're faithful in their generation. But I believe God wants us to be faithful. Acts 13 and 36, for David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell on sleep and was laid unto his fathers and saw corruption. Served his own generation. Do we see ourselves as servants serving the Lord? I'm afraid many ministers see themselves as lords wanting you to serve them. Thus they live opulent lives. I would never live in an ostentatious manner, opulence, at the expense of someone else. That is absolutely one of the most selfish things anyone could possibly do. Looking back in Hebrews 11:35, women received their dead raised to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance. They just didn't want God to deliver them. They died in the faith. Why? That they might obtain a better resurrection. I suppose what is so profound in that statement is the fact that they might obtain a better resurrection. In other words, being resurrected and being left in a mortal body, they didn't see that as significance or whatever the case may be. They didn't accept deliverance. They, they, they died in the faith. That they might obtain a better resurrection. These Saints of God, by faith, were looking for an eternal, immortal resurrection that the Apostle Paul gave us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. If you read that whole 15th chapter, that no doubt is one of the greatest and most profound chapters that deal with the resurrection, glorified bodies, Christ restoring, redeeming everything, once Christ has brought everything full circle, everything is finished and completed, then Christ will then turn around and give it all back to the Father in a perfect state, a perfect state in its entirety. 1 Corinthians 15, 27, For he hath put all things under his feet. But when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifested that he is accepted, which did put all things under him. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in one. So it was God the Father, it was God the Father that made everything subject unto his Son, Jesus Christ, and everything will be put under him, the Father, when everything is said and done because Christ will give it back to him in its totality, fully redeemed. Everything, the earth, the world, everything. This is why we see a new heaven and a new earth in uh, Revelation 21 and 1. So God is going to give all of the redeemed a glorified body. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 44, when we die, Paul said, it is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. You and I are going to receive those supernatural spiritual bodies. Now, just like a seed, a green bean, corn, okra, whatever, you sow it in the soil, but what comes up is so unique and so different than just that little, that little pod. 
that little shriveled up corn seed and out of the ground burst a corn stalk. It grows two, three, sometimes as many as four ears of corn on the stalk. And when it begins to tassel, it's getting near to be picked. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, 38, but God giveth it a body as it hath pleased him and to every seed his own body. So you look at a seed and there are some small differences in all kinds of seed. But when it comes up, you see the magnificence of the difference of the seed. Now listen to me. A green bean seed is small in size, so is a grain of corn seed. But when you have the green beans come up, the bush won't get no higher than maybe uh, a foot off the ground, a lot of foliage, leafy, and then you bend again to put on green beans. But the corn seed, oh, it'll shoot up five, six, maybe as tall as seven feet and has these long leaves, two and three feet long, ribbed leaves. And then these corns, corns, corn cobs begin to grow. But both of them were seed and small in the beginning. And thus Paul says, but God giveth it a body as it hath pleased him. Now you would think in the natural, looking at a, a, a corn seed and a green bean seed, they're small in nature. Sure, they don't look m much alike, but who would have believed the difference in the seed when it comes out of the soil, the height of the corn stalk versus the height of the green bean. You'd think they might be similar in size, wouldn't you? And instead of uh, one seed, you now have corn cobs that are full of kernels, thousands on one stalk, and, and, and they are so vastly different, so so different in so many ways. Why? Because God giveth it a body as it hath pleased him. Maybe I should share verse 37, 1 Corinthians 15, 37. And that which thou sowest, thou sowest not that body that shall be, but bare grain. It may chance of wheat or of some other grain. God's going to give it something tremendously different. You and I, if we live according to the word of God, in the end, we are assured eternal life. We are assured of a glorified body. We will be the immortals. We will be sown in corruption. We will be raised in incorruption. We will be sown in mortality. We will be raised in mort mortality, immortals. These great patriarchs of faith, that they might obtain a better resurrection. They knew if they were raised on this side of the cross, it would still be mortal. They would still be mortal men, just like the woman and her son I shared with you yesterday. I believe it was yesterday. She got her son back, but he, he was brought back in his same mortality. He wasn't immortal. He, he died again. Lazarus, whom Jesus raised in John chapter 11, he died again. But these people in the Old Testament had a faith, a great faith, that they might obtain a better resurrection, and that resurrection would be comparable, exactly the same, as the resurrection of Jesus Christ, immortality. Christ will never die again. As a mortal man, he died as God, he was raised from the dead. God's going to give us this divine nature in our humanity. Now, that, that nature is in us now through the new birth. That nature is in every one of us right now through the new birth, Jesus Christ abiding in us. But there's coming a day, there's coming an hour 
when we're going to receive a glorified body and, and we're going to live and reign with Christ forever, forever and ever and ever and ever. And we have this divine nature. And as I said yesterday, all of this happens by and through the Holy Spirit of God. Everything that happens in your life now is through the Spirit of the Lord. 2 Peter 1 and 4, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. All of the Old Testament saints had these promises. They didn't see them, but they had the promise, and they embraced the promise that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. The new birth in Christ delivers us from the corruption. Now, the body is still corrupt. We know that according to 1 Corinthians 15. The body is still corrupt. The body is 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 diseased, you might say. The human body is diseased. Even as Christians, the body is diseased. But Paul makes the difference there in 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15, 52, talking about us being changed. We'll, we'll look at verse 51. 1 Corinthians 15, 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. That's how quick it's going to be. At the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Rest assured, your humanity is going to be changed from incorruptible, incorruption to, or excuse me, corruptible, into incorruption. It's going to be literally changed. Now, nobody fully understands and knows the gravity of that change. How do we know that? 1 John 3, 1. John said, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Now the world knoweth us not because it knew him not. Beloved, it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. So John says, It doth not yet appear what we shall be. There's an element of uncertainty there. It doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. I want you to think about that for just a moment, please. We're going to be just like Christ in the body. Now, he's Lord of Lord and King of Kings. He will forever have lordship. But I want you to think about the body, the, 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 the humanity, the corruptible, the mortal versus the immortal and incorruptible. Going to have a body just like Christ. Going back to 1 Corinthians 15, 53, for this corruptible must, I love that, must, not happenstance, well, maybe, could be, no, 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 no. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. You will never have to fear, worry about dying again. You'll never be separated again from any loved one. You'll, you'll, you'll never go to the grave and sleep again. When a believer dies, they just go to sleep. If we, if we die before Christ returns, we'll just shut our eyes and go to sleep and we'll know nothing while in the grave. But then, on that resurrection morning, we're going to be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. That's, that's quicker than a, 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 a flash, just so quick. 
Then we'll be able to say, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? Why? Because it will no longer have any kind of dominion, authority, or lordship over our lives. Right now, death rules and reigns. If the Lord tarries, I will die, you will die, those of you listening. But if he doesn't, he returns, will be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. Now, how God does all this, I know, is through the Holy Ghost. But the literal transformation from mortal to immortal, from corruptible to incorruptible, is going to be off the charts. Off the charts. I believe in the incorruptible body there will be no human waste whatsoever. Now, how will that happen? I don't know. But if you're immortal and you're incorruptible, how could you have human waste? Everything about the human body that we know it now will be glorified. Glorified. Every, everything will be restored perfectly. Maybe you're listening and, and you're a diabetic. You'll not have diabetes. Maybe your eyesight is poor. You'll have perfect eyesight. Be supernatural eyesight. Your hearing will return. No, no diseased limbs or body or any, anything like that. Why? Because it will now be glorified, and that's what the Holy Ghost is going to do. The same Spirit that quickened the mortal body of Christ shall also quicken your mortal bodies. And again, there'll be no blood in these bodies. Because in Luke 24, when Jesus appeared to the disciples, he's, they thought they saw a spirit. He said, touch me for a spirit hath not flesh and bone as you see me have. He didn't say blood, did he? Flesh and bone. Well, what makes us alive? The Holy Ghost, the Spirit of God, the same Spirit that lives in you now. Sadly, the Spirit of God lives in, in decaying, decrepit, earthen clay jars. 2 Corinthians 4, 7. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. We, we have this in us now. Christ demonstrated in Luke chapter 9 at Mount Transfiguration what would happen to him. And every person that is a Christian has this same promise and this same hope. You see, the power was in Christ. He, he, he became transformed, transfiguration, his, his, his figuration, his, his, his humanity. Everything about him was glorified, transformed. Then he went back to his human nature. But the power of God had resonance in his earthen clay jar. He bled like a man. He hurt like a man. Uh, Psalm 69, 20. Reproach hath broken mine heart. I am full of heaviness. I looked for some to take pity, but there was none, and for comforters, but I found none. That was the humanity of Christ seeking, desiring somebody to show him compassion. He said, I, I, I looked for comforters. I, I sought for comforters, but what? He said, I found none. They, 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 they didn't exist. Reproach, meaning shame, disgrace, and dishonor, hath broken my heart. I am full of heaviness, and I looked for some to take pity, but there was none, and for comforters, but I found none. I am full of heaviness. I looked for some to take pity, but there was none. But see, Jesus already knew the outcome. I'll surrender my life. I'll die on the cross but I will be raised again. Thus, these people in the Old Testament were looking for a better resurrection. Amen. Verse 36, And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover of bonds and imprisonment. Now the enduring of mocking, scourging, bonds, and imprisonment speaks of Micaiah, and Jeremiah, they suffered mocking, 
scourging, bonds. Remember, Jeremiah was thrown into a pit, imprisonment. Samson was mocked, made sport, the Bible said. They made sport of the man of God. They imprisoned him down at the mill grinding. So a lot of these patriarchs went through a lot of heinous things in their lives. Sad, but true. Jesus had a trial of cruel mocking and scourging. Naboth was not for sale. He had a trial, a trial that was created by Jezebel. The Bible said she got suborned or she got men who would tell lies and make false accusation against the man of God because he would not sell his vineyard. He was not for sale. So he had trial of cruel mockings. So there, there are so many things, and with all respect, today's church does not believe it'll ever see any difficulties. Just, just don't believe it. Ah, I'm not going to suffer anything. No, man, we're, we got, we're going to have it made. Naboth, you might say, was just a great, layman, a great Christian, just like Stephen. They loved the Lord. They weren't for sale. They would not compromise. They would not deny Christ. They would not, like Naboth, he, he valued his heritage. The older I get, the more I value my heritage. I feel I've been exceptionally blessed because of my heritage, how I was raised. Now, I got away from God and lived a very debauched and debased life, but I, I always knew what was right. I always knew what God expected of me. Though I wasn't doing it, I knew what God desired, what God wanted out of me. I, I just didn't want to be a preacher. I didn't want to have to sacrifice my life. So, you know, no matter what you may aspire no matter the ambitions that you have, if Jesus has touched your life for a purpose, you can kiss all that goodbye. You can, you can just abandon all of that. You, you, well, I don't want to abandon that. Well, I'm sorry. You, you must abandon that. You, you must abandon that. Um, I, I, I know that some of you know that God has touched your life for a reason, for a purpose, and you don't want to surrender to that. You must surrender all. You must surrender all to Christ. That is not always easy. That, that, that is never easy to surrender all. Some will surrender 90%, but they want to withhold the 10%. That's kind of selfish, if I must say so. It's either all or nothing. This is why I, I, I grappled, because I knew once I surrendered and submitted to the call of God, I would be on another trajectory, another course. My life would go in another way, another total different way, and this is, this is why people say, well, uh, you know, I, I don't want to make that kind of sacrifice. I, you know, they, they want to serve God on their terms. They, they want to serve God on their terms. You know, they want, they want to make the, the rules. They want to make the regulations. They want to make this. They want to make the, You don't get to make that choice. See, many are called, but few are chosen. Why are few chosen? Because only a few will truly choose to follow Christ no matter what, no matter what. Now, following Christ is never going to be easy. I promise you that. There, there, there are those who think this is a gravy train. The preachers that preach that 
no pain, no suffering, never no difficulties. That, that's just not the gospel of Christ. And when you read the, the patriarchs in the Old Testament and you read the accounts of the New Testament saints of God, the things that they endured, the things that they suffered, they went through some very, very, very difficult times. Why? Following Christ means bearing your cross, which takes me back again to discipline, discipleship. Following Jesus will cost you everything. But see, many people don't want to pay the ultimate price. And when I say that, I don't necessarily mean death, though that may come, just like it did with Stephen, just like it did with Naboth. <laughs> These men were killed for their, for their loyalty, you know. Uh, Paul was beheaded. Peter was crucified upside down. John was boiled. John was put on the Isle of Patmos. Just, just so many things that these people suffered. How can you read the 11th chapter of Hebrews and then say, well, I don't believe Christians today will suffer that. That is absolutely heresy. Romans chapter 15, verse 4 says, For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might find hope. Everything that was written in the Old Testament, Paul says, they were written for a purpose, and that purpose was for our learning. We need to learn from the records and the accounts of things that happened in the Old Testament. Let me quote it again. For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning. I've said this all of my Christian life. Don't ever go through a trial. Don't ever go through a circumstance. Don't ever go through a situation and not learn anything from it. That, that's the most foolish thing you can do is go through a, a, a stretch or a, a patch of of time in your life that is very arduous and very difficult, and you don't learn anything from the troubles and the trials. Learning from those things helps you to say, I won't make that mistake again. I won't do that again. I won't say that again. I'll keep my mouth closed. I'll, I'll keep my mouth shut. I, I just won't say that. I won't do that. Whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience... There's that word patience, Luke 21, 19. In your patience, possess ye your souls. In other words, you lose your patience, you might lose your soul. Jesus was unbelievably patient during the heinous trial and mocking. They would make accusation and Jesus would say, thou hast said, thou hast said. Or he opened not his mouth. They slapped him. They spit on him. He stayed patient through it all. Hebrews 12, 2, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and to sit down at the right hand of the throne of God. He could see beyond the cross. He could see beyond the crucifixion. He could see the resurrection. He could see his ascension. He could see him seated at the right hand of the Father. Thus, who for the joy, Hebrews 12 and 2, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. We need to be like that in, in this way, this sense. No matter what I go through, there's a better day coming. No matter what I suffer, there's a better day coming. No matter I, what I have to endure or how long I have to endure it, there's a better day coming. I, I got a letter the other day from a lady. Her husband has cancer. She has breast cancer. And they wanted prayer. And, I, I, you know, I knelt down. I said, oh, Lord, I, th I think, I can't remember because 
Uh, I just have too much on my mind, but my wife and I anointed a couple of prayer calls and mailed them. Many of us don't really have any problems. We, we think we have problems. And the lady who also has cancer is the caregiver for her husband. You know, you, you, you think you've got it tough. No, you don't, you don't really have it tough. You just think you have it tough. When you read some of the letters I read or some of the emails, it, it just grieves my spirit. It grieves my heart. And I realize just how blessed I am. I, I realize just how blessed I am. We, we, we all go through some difficult places. You know, before the revival meeting, I had my wife at the hospital on Tuesday night and then back in the hospital on Thursday. Had a terrible kidney stone. They had to laser it and get it. And then she came in on Friday morning as we started the meeting and had a, had a rough week. You know, our lives are not always easy, but we remain faithful because we know who we serve and we know the end will be with a blessing. That's why, that's why Jesus said, you got to endure. And when you read Hebrews 11, you see how all of these patriarchs, how they endured the hardship and the sufferings that came into their lives. They didn't quit. They, they didn't roll over and say, well, this is just too hard. Joseph didn't say, no, no, no. And here's he's a teenager. And Joseph is not 40 years of age. He's 17 years old. When you are analytical and you look at these saints of God and you look at the, the mockings and the trials and the imprisonment and the bonds, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and these people remain steadfast, ask yourself this question, can I remain that steadfast as those saints of God did? The easiest thing in the world that anyone can do relative to serving Christ is just quit. That's the easiest thing to do. I, I just quit, you know? And sometimes we all feel like that, don't we? We all get fatigued spiritually. We all get weary spiritually. We get fatigued and weary physically. Galatians 5, 9, Paul said, let us not be weary excuse me, Galatians 6, 9, let us not be weary in well-doing, for we shall reap in due season if we faint not. So we can become weary. We can become faint in heart. All of these things can happen to us. Why? We are living in these clay jars. And sometimes it feels like the difficulties are insurmountable. They are just more than we can bear. They are just more than we can endure. But you got to remember something. Christ is there with you to get you from the beginning to the end. Christ will get us through everything that's coming if we trust in him. I, I don't know the day nor the hour, but America, if America does not repent, America is going to witness some dark days some difficult days, and it's all going to be because of sin. That's, that's going to be the reason. Well, it's this, it's that, it's the, the governments, the leadership. Yeah, they're all bad. They're all pathetic. You know, Joe Biden said you got lousy senators and you got lousy presidents. I reckon he was speaking of himself. The point is we're going to see some difficulties because of sin. Sin is what brings all this negativity into our lives. All the negativity that is swirling around the world. The world is in a whirlwind right now. The whole entire world. The talk of World War III, the talk of nuclear war, all the war. But what did Jesus tell us? Matthew 24, 6, and you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. 
See that you be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. This stuff is going to happen. And you're not going to be raptured out to escape all of this. Yes, we are. Yes, we are. If you'll pray and get sincere with God, my youngest son the other night, he came in and he, he said, I, I reread 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. He said, how can anybody read that in and, and all honesty and, and, say, and say there's anything different? I said, but, but they do, son. I remember when I was a young preacher and I addressed that. I, 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 I wanted to talk to men about that. Oh, you're too young. You don't understand. You, you know, and my, my, my son says to me, wait a minute. He said the rapture will not take place except there first come a falling away and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. He said, it's too plain, Dad. I said, yes, it's plain. It's, 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 it's there. It's, it's, it's evident. It's the word of God. It ain't, it ain't a mortal man that, saying this. It was a mortal man that penned it. But the mortal man was inspired by the Holy Spirit of God to write these things. That's why we embrace the, 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 the canon of Scripture, because there's truth all in it. You know, in, in the, the revival meeting, I was, I, was, I was preaching on the Holy Spirit on Saturday morning. And I said Jesus was trying to get his followers to understand the power of the Word of God, because the power of the Word of God is full of the Holy Ghost. John 6 and 63, it is the Spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. He said, my words are spirit, my words are life. What is he telling us? He's telling us his word is full of the Holy Ghost. His word is full of the Holy Ghost. That's why the word quickens us. That's why the word of God is a revelation to us. Because it is full and filled of the Holy Spirit of God. Jesus said it is the spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profiteth nothing. Oh, that just hurt a few feelings right there. Can I tell you, candidly, your flesh, your humanity is unprofitable. But if you live and walk in the Holy Ghost, it is profitable. Not unprofitable, but it is very profitable. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit, they are life. Jesus is saying, listen, Understand, my word, the Bible, is full of the Holy Spirit of God, full of the power of God. That's why Paul said in Hebrews 4.12, for the word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to dividing sunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Paul is telling us the Word of God is full of the Holy Ghost, just like Jesus said the Word of God was full of the Holy Ghost. And it divides asunder. To, to asunder means to cut it, fillet it, cut it apart. To the dividing sunder of soul and spirit, God divides even the spiritual man, the soul and the spirit, and of the joints and marrow, talking about our humanity, and thirdly, is a discerner of the faults and intents of the heart. The Word of God discerns our hearts. It discerns our thoughts. This is why it's imperative to preach the Word of God. The Word of God will discern the congregation. The Word of God will discern the listener. The Word of God will discern the hearer. And he knows how to take the Word and, and assimilate it and then put it into their heart, put it into their mind, put it into their spirit. Put it into their spirit. 
and they get what they need from the word of God. David said, O oh, taste and see that the Lord is what? He is good. You, you ingest the word of God. It is good for the soul. It is good for the heart. It is good for us in every sense of the word. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Psalms 34, verse 8. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. Remember John the Revelator ate the book? Sweet, like honey. But when it got in his belly, it was a little bit bitter. You see, sometimes following Christ, the way becomes bitter. The way becomes difficult. And because of that, some people lay Christ aside. And I do believe this. In the coming days, a lot of people are going to say, I didn't bargain for this. You know, this best life now, where is it? Where is it? I'm suffering. I'm, I'm being persecuted for my faith. I heard someone say the other day, that um, the nominal church will stay on the surface. The true church will ultimately go underground. And, and, and the nominal church, religious people, are going to persecute the godly, the righteous. I mean, as I said yesterday, when I read the other day, Matthew 28, the lying, the cheating, the dishonesty, the bribery. <laughs> I thought, Lord, how mercy. Lord, how mercy. This has been going on forever. Even in the book of Exodus, as early as the book of Exodus, Moses talked about how a bribe perverts, distorts men. They, 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 they get money and they, they seek to bribe someone for a purpose, for a reason. You know, politics, you know, lobbyist in Washington. They bribe the, the congressmen and the senators. And, the, the, and, and see, when you take the bribe, you become corrupted. You, as long as you reject the bribe, you're, you're, you're not corrupt. You're not sullied. You're not soiled. Once you take the bribe, you're just as corrupt as the briber. You're just as corrupt as the briber. And then you both become corrupt from both sides. That's America. What's in it for me? That's why I love the story of Naboth. He just couldn't be bought. Ahab said, I, I, I tried to buy it. I tried to swap him another vineyard for his vineyard. See, Ahab was covetous. He tried to bribe. But Naboth says, wait a minute, pal, this is my inheritance. I, I, I can't forfeit this. I, I can't relinquish this. This is mine. God gave this to me. And I see that. I don't know what tribe Naboth would have been from, but I see that in the sense God told Israel of the tribes, you're going to get this portion of land, just like Caleb. Give me this mountain. And so he inherited the land, the vineyard, and he wasn't willing to sacrifice it or give it up. And here's the king who in all respect should have been an honest forthright and never have done that to the man of God. But again, Ahab was corrupt. His wife Jezebel was corrupt. Her father, his name was Ethbal, part of Baal, Ethbal. So they tried to soul and sully Naboth. He said, I I'm not going to do it. So they put a trial. This is, this is what it means. Others had trial.
Are we going to put on trial? Are we going to be put on trial for our faith? In the coming days, some of us may be literally put on trial for our faith. And don't think the devil don't have a a, a plethora of people that will lie against you. If you're doing what's right, if you're living right, serving God, Satan will find suborned men to lie on you and discount you and say all sorts of evil falsely. That was that was in the Beatitudes, Matthew 5, 11 and 12. Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil falsely against you for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Nothing has changed throughout history. And Jesus said, Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely. Now, I know some of you listening have experienced that, and so have I. People just flat out lie on you, twist your words. They'll, they say things that you didn't say. They'll add to, they'll take away. They'll, they'll make it something other than what it really was. But that's, that's how the devil does it. But what did Christ say in respect to that? Rejoice. Be exceedingly glad. Great is your reward in heaven. You're blessed when people persecute you, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. So this is this has been a history with the devil and his minions persecuting the righteous, persecuting the redeemed, persecuting the faithful, persecuting. He's going to do it again in the time of the end. Because when we get to the time of the end, the ultimate end, Satan is going to work overtime in trying to destroy people's lives. Remember Revelation 12, 12. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. For the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. Satan knows once he's kicked out of heaven, he cannot approach the throne of God anymore, never again. He knows his time is short. Thus he comes with great wrath. That is the tribulation. The wrath of Satan, not the wrath of God. Thank you for listening. Thank you for allowing us to come into your home. Thank you for allowing us to share the word of the Lord in your heart and in your life. Let me say today, thank you so much for your love, your many, many prayers, and your faithful support. We thank you so much. Share the program. Share the ministry. God is opening doors. The ministry is continuing to grow. And for that, we are very much humbled. God bless you. I'll see you next week in the Lord Jesus Christ. The Voice Christ. of Evangelism with David Langford is brought to you by the faithful listeners and supporters throughout America. If you're looking for an uncompromising message, we invite you to tune in each week to The Voice of Evangelism. For more information, write to The Voice of Evangelism at P.O. Box 502, Kayser, North Carolina, 28020. That's P.O. Box 502, Kayser, North Carolina, 28020.